I hope you enjoyed this song. That came out uh, recently, and I saw that, and that, that really fits with where we're going today. So I hope you are blessed by it. And today, actually, what we're doing, we're taking a short break from Mark 14. Now, I found Mark 14, obviously, there's a lot of emotion, right? There, especially Judas' betrayal that, that's brewing. And we know, we know that suffering, intense suffering is looming in the coming verses. And so with that in mind, I wanted to look at a psalm that is also filled with a lot of emotion. And the psalm I'm referring to is Psalm 13, written by David. And the reason I thought this would be helpful to kind of combine with our study in Mark 14 is because Psalm 13 is a lament, which by nature helps believers process their emotions in difficult times. You know, Psalm 13 was written during a dark time in David's life. I think it would be safe to say that David was struggling. How do I handle life? And although David doesn't feel betrayed by God, he clearly feels something very similar. David felt abandoned by God. He wasn't, he wasn't abandoned by God, but he felt like it. And the amazing thing is that for us, by looking at psalms like this, these types of psalms help equip us. Equip us for that moment when life crashes in on us. The problem is, you know, in those dark hours, those dark days, those dark months, maybe even years, we still have choices to make. We shall still have a direction to set. But unfortunately we find ourselves not prepared for those tough seasons in life, we're going to find ourselves responding in unhealthy ways and taking ourselves in a direction that we don't want to be traveling. The fact is, when trouble comes our, may, our way, many times we just take the easier route, right? It, it is a whole lot easier just to wallow in pain and trouble rather than turn to God in the midst of pain and trouble. So let's learn how David moved from, from pain to praise. If you've got your Bibles, your phones, please turn with me to Psalm chapter 13. And I'm actually doing the whole chapter, and you might go, oh, but it's only six verses, so it's okay. Psalm 13, to the choir master, a psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me. O Lord my God, light up my eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Let's just pray to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, even just as we have sung about today, for your goodness and your mercy to us. We thank you, Lord, that there is hope, hope in our life and in our death. Lord, and I just pray that you just help us to See your presence, not just in the good times, but in the hard times. And we would always look to you, even in those when times are tough. Help me to speak clearly. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would just move us. Lord, that we would be a people that would trust in you, whatever we are facing, that we would look to your promises. We ask this in the name of your Son. Amen. So as you can gather this psalm that we're reading David, he's like, he's like next door to the land of despair. It's like he's, he's like almost done with everything. Now, it's worth mentioning that in Psalm 12, the psalm previous, David feels alone because he feels, you know, all the faithful people, they're gone. I, I, don't, ha I don't have anyone. And if not having a trusted person to turn to is bad enough, here now in Psalm 13, David now feels abandoned by God prompts him to write this lament. Now, you might be asking, okay, Sean, what is a lament? 
Well, by definition, a lament is a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. Or, I could say it another way, it is what we say when we feel totally hurt, betrayed, scared. In the words Mark, of Mark Vergope, which I think is up on the screen in his book, Dark Clouds and Deep Mercy, a biblical lament is how we bring our sorrows to God. And then he added, lament is how you live between the poles of a hard life and trusting God's goodness. Very simply, a lament is what we say to God when a friend betrays us. It's what we say to God when a spouse leaves us. Or that family member that we love so dearly passes away. Lament is what we say to God when we walk out of that doctor's office being told that we have cancer. Lament is what we say to God when we're down, when we're hurt, and we don't know where to turn. Lament is a prayer to God when life just is not making sense to us. Now, as we look at Psalm 13, we notice that the Psalms actually starts off with a series of questions. And these questions are directed to the right place, but they have a very desperate tone. I don't know if you saw that or not. Verse 1, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? That phrase, how long, it's just like, off the page, right? It's happening like four times. David's telling us, hey, this just isn't a bad day. This is not just a painful week. This, this is a, a really rough season of life. And the questions that Dave, David is asking, they're not questions that are, let me gather some more data type questions. No, he's trying to express the feeling that I can't take it any longer. David feels that God has forgotten him forever and that God has hidden his face from him. Have you ever experienced the feeling of abandonment from God? Sadly, for some, if they're at a point where they've concluded, I don't think anybody around me really cares about me, then guess what? We're not too far off the track from starting to believe that God doesn't care about us either. David feels that God has chosen to forget him, jo chosen to hide his face from him. In David's mind, God has concluded, no more loving care for David. My guess is that David, likely down deep, knows that God has not forgotten his people, but he just simply feels that God has forgotten about him. Verse 2, the how long questions keep going. How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Basically, David wants to know when his heart will stop aching. And he describes his, his heart as, as being sorrowful, sorrowful all day. And he also wants to know, how long, how long should I expect my enemies to be winning? Now, we should talk about David's enemies for a moment. Because in all fairness to David, his enemies are likely very different than the enemies we've ever had. I've had lots of people not like me. I've had some even hate me. But to the best of my knowledge, no one has ever tried to take my life. But David's enemies are powerful. They want to do violence to him. And David's enemies, they're going to be happy. They're, they're going to rejoice when David goes down. And, and so David's enemies, they've got the upper hand on him. And he feels, David begins to feel ignored, forgotten by God. In summarizing David's pain, the Bible knowledge commentary says this, David wants to know how long will this continue as it seems very like very, seems like every day is as painful as the previous day and making things worse it appears that God has apparently abandoned him. Now, I want to spend a few moments just talking about, you know, some things that could happen, some possible reasons that could cause a follower of Jesus Christ to feel abandoned of God. And and although this is not an exhaustive exhaustive list, James Montgomery Boyce in his commentary suggests a few things and, and I think you'll, you'll find them helpful and possibly you can relate to some of them. The first reason he suggests that we can feel abandoned by God is simply the length of time that we've had to endure a particular struggle. Short-term pain is one thing, but when we're asked, we've asked God to intervene, but he seems silent on a particular issue, over time we may assume that God is not responding to our requests because he does not really care about us. A second reason that we may feel 
cause us to feel abandoned by God is that we sense that we've lost a blessing. We've lost the blessings of God that we had earlier in our lives. When David asks, how long, God, will you hide your face from me? That implies something. That implies that there was a time when God's face was shining on him. But now it's like this blessing seems to have disappeared. And that same feeling can happen to us. For example, let's say in your married life, you felt God's blessing, right? But now, ah, everything just seems so stressed. There's conflict all the time. And you ask, where is God in all of that? Or maybe a once really happy family situation has been replaced by rebellious kids who no longer even believe that God exists. And we wonder, has God forgotten our family? Apply that same school of thought to, to our work. Perhaps we had success in the early years. Now we're tr having trouble keeping up. Maybe the company is struggling. Pastors can experience this too, right? Church experiences a, a time of, of growth, and then it's replaced by a difficult time, time with, marred with conflict. And we ask, has God left the building, so to speak? Here's the issue. It's not if things will go wrong in our life. It is a question of when they will go wrong. And it is in those times... It is in those hard times there is temp this temptation to believe that God has forgotten about us. And that is where David is at. And the amazing thing is about God's word, it, it not only confronts us, it brings us hope. Hope because he gives us a way out. So take hope because in the next verses we're going to see this incredible pattern that's going to help us to find a way out from the pain. In the middle of this psalm in verses 3 and 4, I don't know if you noticed it, but there's like a tone change. Because now, instead of David lamenting, you know, now we see David, oh, he's beginning to communicate to God. And it's interesting because in these verses, David actually doesn't ask God to remove the pain. He Rather, he just simply wants to talk to God about the pain. Verse 3, consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. I mentioned Mark Vergope's book, Dark Clouds and Deep Mercy, uh, already. But I have to admit, this book it really helped me understanding how David processed his pain. And one warning that he gave, I want to pass on to you. Because he says, many people never reach this turning point in their lives. David was down and out, right? And then verse 3, things started to change. But the problem is that for many people, we don't have a verse 3. It's like we get stuck. We find ourselves complaining. And complaining is not only sinful, complaining hurts us. One of the ways that complaining hurts us is that we develop this resistance to talk to God about our struggles. Oh yeah, we might pick up the phone and talk to someone about our, our struggles, or we might rant on social media, but we don't take our concerns to God. Why is that? Why do we complain, but then we're resistant to talk to God? about anything. On the website Got Questions, it said this about complaining. A complaining spirit reveals a lack of trust in God. You see, trust in God is really what helped David turn this corner. Because at this midway point in the psalm, sure, David's still hurting, right? But he is choosing to trust. Did you notice the way that he addressed God in, in, in those verses? Oh Lord, my God. The names that he uses are, are pretty significant. Lord, all capitals in, in our version, that is Yahweh, right? It's the covenant-keeping eternal God. And the word God that he uses there is Elohim. It's referring to God's power and his strength. And notice what he's asking for. He's asking for light in his eyes. It seems like kind of an odd request, but really what he's wanting is he, he just wants to better be able to see the situation. And note that it seems fairly apparent that in his pain, it is being caused by his enemies. He's asking God to stop his enemies from prevailing against him. Verse 4, lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. You know, obviously prevailing over David is something that his enemies are seeking. Right? They're working pretty hard to achieve this. And it looks like they're actually kind of in party mode because they've been able to shake him. 
And what is significant here is that David is now calling on God to rescue him from his situation. If I could think of one word to describe that got David to this turning point, it would be the word trust. And hang on to that word. That's going to be significant for us. And this is what you need to know about trusting God. And that is, trust is a continual thing. It's not as if we pray one prayer and we never have to trust again. It doesn't work that way. Especially when life goes sideways. Vergope said, it's not that simple. Grief is not that tame. You know, one of the purposes of laments like Psalm 13 is they, they lead us somewhere. They lead us to trusting in God. And in this simple moment of trust, we, we now see it paying great dividends, right? Because David's decision to trust in these dark times, oh, it's changing everything for him. Earlier we saw David exaggerating his sorrows, right? Claiming, oh, God has abandoned me, which was not true. Sure, he's talking to God, but now the difference is he's, he's willing to listen to God. Look at verse 5. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. But I have trusted. And now, instead of David wallowing in his pain, he is choosing to trust. And his trust isn't some positive type thinking statement. His trust is based on the character of God. And at this point, I need to make a plug for followers of Jesus reading God's word every day. Do you do that? Do you daily read the Bible for yourself? Because here's the thing. How can you trust in the character of God if you're not spending time in his word learning about his character? By you choosing to ignore God's word, by claiming, ah, you know what, I'm just really busy, um, I, I'm not really a reader, you are deciding to neglect the means by which God has chosen to communicate to us. Not a good plan. You know, I meet followers of Jesus who want to change. I generally find two types of people. The first group, they, they, they don't really want to put effort into changing. They just simply don't like how they feel, and they're, they're feeling the weight of their, their lack of fellowship with God, and they somehow think I can fix it. The other group is hungry to talk to God. They want to learn His ways because they believe, oh, God's Word, it is a source of hope. And they want to build a relationship with the God that created them. And for David, he knows God's Word, and he's wanting to act on it. So that's why the tone is changing, right? That's why he's, he's talking about rejoicing. David is trusting, and he's believing what he knows to be true about God. David still likely doesn't know why he is suffering, but he's trusting God, and he's taking the time to get to know him better. David's situation hasn't changed, but he's choosing to trust in God's unfailing love. Did you see that? I have trusted in your steadfast love. If you take time to read God's word for yourself, you'll soon learn that God's got a history with his people. Right? A history that proves he is trustworthy. And you will see the great blessing that's, that happens to anyone that chooses to trust him. And did you notice what part of God's provision that David is focusing on? He is choosing to trust the Lord's salvation. Right? He is looking forward to a day when he will sing praises to the Lord for his goodness. But again, how is David, how does he get to this position? It was a turning point of prayer. James Montgomery Boyce said this, when all things seem against us, driving us to feel hopeless, we always have an open door to pray to God. You know, for the Christian, the fact is that God loves us. And He'll be faithful to us, regardless of how we've, we're feeling. That means regardless of what our feelings tell us, we need to pray like David does. It's about praying to God consistently, a sense of urgency, especially when we're locked into a situation that is tempting us to feel, oh, I think God has abandoned you. David's Felix told him that God had abandoned him, told him that his enemies were going to win, but now he is trusting in what God has already revealed about himself, and he's praying to God. We see David make this decisive turn, which caused him to make this powerful affirmation, verses 5 and 6. 
David is going to trust in God's steadfast love. And you might push back and you might say, ah, oh, you know what, I've never tasted God's steadfast love. But the deal is this, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that means that you too have experienced His steadfast love. And what I mean by that is your relationship with Jesus at a starting point, right? It had a point where you admitted your sin, a point where you asked for forgiveness, and by faith you believed in Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. It was a point where you understood that Jesus loved you enough to die for you. So, follower of Jesus, guess what? You have a record of God's steadfast love. When you became a Christian, that meant you trusted in what God said about you, and you trusted what God said about Himself. Point being, we came to faith by believing that the Bible is true. We believe that forgiveness is possible for those who receive Christ. And by trusting in God's grace, we became part of His family. And Vergope says that was only the beginning. By David, trusting in God's steadfast love means that even though his situation uh, didn't improve, even though his, his, his heart was still hurting, his heart was now moved from sorrow, and now he finds himself rejoicing. Rejoicing in the salvation that God has provided for him. See, regardless of whatever you're facing right now, know this. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, no one can separate you from him. And in whatever loss you would experience, you'll, you'll never lose the eternal blessing of being a child of God because His love is steadfast. God has loved us enough to send His Son to rescue us, and He is not going to abandon you or I now. And so however you are suffering, that does not mean that God has forgotten you. It doesn't mean that He's rejected you. For God says, choosing to trust through the lament requires that we rejoice without knowing how to connect all the dots. Verse 6, we see that David's perspective in life, is, it's totally changed, right? We've, we, we've gone from sorrow to trusting, and now this feeling of rejoicing is now compelling David to sing. Verse 6, I will sing to the Lord because He has dealt bountifully with me. Make no mistake about it. By talking to God about our pain, by David choosing to trust in the character of God, his heart, it's been reoriented from complaints and requests to now he, he's got this like faith-filled worship thing going. You know, I think the type of music we listen to and our decision whether or not we're going to sing praise to the Lord is a big deal. And we learn from this psalm that sometimes singing actually has the power to convince our emotions to change. And this is a little off topic, and this is just my opinion, but I have a story I want to share with you. And in the late 1990s, up to about 2008, our family was heavily involved in a church in Collingwood, and we loved it there. We really did. And one of the guys I got to know there, his name was Bill. It's not his real name, but that's what I'm going to refer to him as. Bill, I think, was probably about 10 years younger than me, married, had kids, good job, super fun guy to be with. He's just one of those guys you just like hanging out with. Well, a few years after we moved away, we heard that Bill had taken a drive out into the country with a shotgun and ended his life. And I don't know all the details, but for some weird reason, I often wondered what music Bill would have been focusing on in that final trip. I doubt very much that Bill, when he took that last ride, was listening to praise music about Jesus. And I'm not sure why my mind thought that soon after I heard about his death. And I honestly, I don't know what was on his playlist. All I'm saying is this. We are a broken people. And we are trying to do life in a very broken world. And life is tough enough. And we know that already that we're prone to struggle Right? So why would we allow garbage in our lives? We need to be so careful what we allow into our lives. You know, I think we need to ask some hard questions of ourselves if we neglect worshiping God with our voices when He so clearly has displayed His steadfast love to us. The Lord has dealt bountifully with David. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, He's been bountiful to you. 
Vergob says, lament is how you live between the hard life and God's promises. It is how you learn to sing and worship when suffering comes our way. You know, however you feel about the psalm, you have to appreciate the honesty to which David shared in this psalm. Let, let's be honest. You wouldn't be surprised to hear someone like, talk like this who's not a follower of Jesus Christ, right? But if a follower of Jesus Christ came up to you and told you, you they, thought, they felt abandoned by God, you'd think, ah, you know, that'd be like unthinkable. But here in Psalm 13, we find David talking about it. And it's important for us to know that without a doubt, David loved God, right? In Psalm, or 1 Samuel 13, David, he, we can see he's used powerfully by God. And he's referred to as, uh, as a man after God's own heart. Yet this, this psalm records a time when David felt totally abandoned by God. We have hope. David shows us that. In the span of six verses, life went from total turmoil to singing praises to God. And relating this again to our study in Mark 14, we see that Jesus is obviously no stranger to pain. And we know by what he accomplished at the cross, there can be great gain through suffering. For Gob says, the suffering and pain can bring clarity. Adding, it can affirm our trust. And as David showed, suffering can become a platform to worship. You know, I've referred to this book a number of times and in closing, I want to show, share a true story that he writes in this book. Like, it's a book about suffering, right? And he didn't write this in a vacuum. He knew pain close up and personal. And I, I've shared this before, but I, I think it warrants, warrants sharing again. He writes this. No, Lord, I plead. Please not this. It was 2004, and my wife Sarah awakened me, concerned that something was wrong with her pregnancy. A few days from her due date, she had not slept most of the night, waiting for our baby to move. Hours of tapping the tummy, shifting positions, and offering tear-filled prayers only increased my wife's concern. Inside her womb stillness. Later that afternoon, the doctor placed a monitor on Sarah's womb, searching for a heartbeat, but there was silence. He goes on to say that later that day, Mark sat by his wife's side as she endured hours of labor. They prayed, they cried, and after many hours of labor, they held a nine-pound baby girl who was lifeless. He said this about his daughter, Sylvia. She was beautiful, but not alive. At the end of the book, he summarizes what it's like to do life in a world like ours. He writes this, until that day, we live between two worlds. Believers in Jesus are called to walk the path between earthly brokenness and heavenly restoration. And I don't know what your story you have. I don't know what laws you've experienced or are experiencing. I can tell you this, though. God is okay to hear about your doubts. He's okay to hear about your fears. And he may not answer the prayers the way you want, but he has provided a pathway for you. And this pathway is called trust. God's not calling us to grit it out. He's not calling us to trust in our own strength. He has called us to trust in Him. When John Piper heard about the Vergope's loss, he said this, he said, keep trusting the one who keeps you trusting. You know, one final thing I, I want to share with you today, and I don't know if you noticed this or not, you should have this slip of paper on there. And we have a box and we have pens over by the coffee. But I'm going to ask you to do something. You don't have to, obviously. I can't make you do it. But on it just simply says, I choose to trust Jesus Christ with. What is the with for you? I am asking you to make a choice. I am asking you to make a choice. That There's a young crowd here. Right? You've you got a, a lifetime ahead of you. I am asking you to trust Jesus Christ with something, the significant part of your life. What is it that he's calling you to trust him? You know what it is. And if you want, you can put it in that box. You don't have to put your name on it. You can. I will be taking these home. I'll be praying through these this week. Because I want to be a part of a church that trusts in Jesus Christ. Whatever God would take us through. 
I'm going to ask Pastor Nathan if he'd come up at this time.